Gigi. Gigi, come visit. Okay. <laughs> Good day. Welcome to Great White Retro. I'm Gord Fessick, and well, this is my dog Gigi. Our topic today is this Commodore 128 supplied by Roadkill Incorporated over in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're going to try to get it cleaned up and retro brighted in time for our show over at St. Paul Elder Services. Let's get her done. Those, here's the 128 before we do any cleanup at all. That label is peeling off and oh my goodness, is it yellowed. <laughs> By the way, when I filmed this, I was still learning how to use my iPhone 14's camera, so the color is not a match on screen as it actually is in person, but even here you can see that something was set on top of this machine that made it yellow quite differently in some spots, lighter in others, darker in other spots entirely. Definitely different from that stock power supply. <laughs> So here's the challenge. First, we're going to try to clean these labels up by removing them. This uh, floss pick is great for pulling off labels as long as you're really careful. Here you can see the color difference dramatically. <laughs> My goodness. Anyway, we'll start taking this thing apart. These use uh, Torx 10 screws that uh, Commodore adopted uh, later on as well. This proved difficult because the Torx set that I have, <laughs> some of the bits don't actually stay in place on the screwdriver, so hey. It took some effort, but we did get these screws out and we were able to take this thing apart. There we go. There were still a couple of snaps that held the thing in place as well, plus the keyboard was held in place with a grounding strap right there on the motherboard. Okay, there we go. That keyboard connector is actually a good match for the cable on the Commodore 128D. The only thing I'm going to have to worry about on here is these heat sinks on the RF shield. I'm just going to clean these up and put on some fresh heat sink compound. This board works, so I'm not going to mess with it too, too much. It is actually also soldered down in place in, in one corner, right near the keyboard connector. And then there are these metal tabs that are uh, bent out as well, so I'm going to have to take a pair of pliers to straighten out all those tabs. But sooner or later, yeah, here I am trying to figure out why is this thing not coming off? Nope, I gotta get the tabs off, and there's my needle nose. So we get all those off, and then the RF shield comes off, or so I thought it would anyway. <laughs> Almost. All right, and we don't need to mess with the board yet. I mean, if anything, I just want to fix all of these these heat sink contacts and put some fresh compound on. But this board works. I don't need to do anything major to it. I just wanted to make sure that I got the case covers off. And you can now see a clear contrast between the original color and the yellowed color. So. With any luck, we'll get all of this cleaned up, but first we gotta yank off all of these keys. And there's a lot of keys to do. <laughs> okay, more Torx 10 screws. The 128 uses identical screws for everything except for the RF shield over the video equipment. That uses a standard Phillips screw. Also, that uh, power LED is only held in place with pressure, so I'm gonna have to be careful when replacing that. I'll explain how I do that when I put this back together. Anyway, I try using my modern key puller like I used on the VIC-20, and it worked for a few of the keys. It was not the easiest key to pull off. In fact, that escape key ended up being really difficult to pull off. But once we got this apart, we can now start scrubbing the case. Much like I did with the Atari, with the VIC-20, with the Apple. Just good old soap and water first, followed by alcohol to remove some of the scuffs, and baking soda to remove some of those really stubborn stains that were on there. There we are. Trying to be extra careful with those air vents. The 128's uh, chips run really warm compared to previous uh, Commodore machines, so I want to be careful to make sure these things are clean and I don't disrupt airflow at all.
we go, not bad. I use my floss pick again to gently remove this bottom label here. No made in USA on that one. In fact, I'm not even sure it says where it's made. All I had to do was get enough of it off that I can then peel the rest off with my fingers. And there we are. We'll clean that up, we'll get all the old adhesive off with some alcohol. And I'll put this label back on with some double-sided tape just like I have before. There were a few spots I had to wipe off, but nothing crazy. The area around the top label was especially stubborn, there was this really hard adhesive. I got a lot of it off, but I think I had to scrape off the rest with a sharp object. Here come the kitchen utensils again. Oh my goodness. That just would not come off. Nope, that little hump is going to stay there, so there's nothing more I can do about it except just get as much off of there as I can and get this thing ready for retro brighting. This is going to be an especially tough retro brighting challenge. But that's why I picked this machine, to see just what I could get away with. Here it is, just outside of the tank. There you go, you can see a clear contrast again, the, the, the bottom and the inside of the case. I got the snaps in place, but not the screws, so I can put the whole thing in, and I'll use a rock to hold it in place in the middle. There's the case. I fill up my boiling hot water, I top it up with some tap water, just as I've done before. There we go, 35% hydrogen peroxide. Pretty much the st strongest stuff you can buy. And we'll come back to this in a few hours. Next comes cleaning these keys, and this time I just used soap and water to clean these keys. I don't want to risk the damage that I did with alcohol. These actually cleaned up pretty good. They're just a little yellowed. But then that's where we're gonna try to do the retro brighting next. I didn't actually retro bright the top layer keys or the top row keys, just these. There we go. I use a plate to hold all the keys in place. Add a little bit. Next time, just add a little bit of the stuff. There we go. Nah, stay under there, keys. <laughs> I'm going to need something to hold the bottom of these keys better so that they stay underwater. Now this time I used uh, the larger element uh, to heat that up, and that's going to cost me later on. Next, let's get this uh, RF shield off, and we'll use a soldering iron to get that one soldered bit off of there. And there we are. A nice big blob of solder there on the shield there. We'll have to deal with that when we put this case back on. I clean off the old uh, heatsink compound. That empty socket is deliberate. I think Commodore wanted to be able to offer ROM options for this thing, but the stock C128 has that empty, and I'm not going to bother with that uh, video area. There we go, some fresh heatsink compound on the other areas there. I bent these tabs out a bit so that when I put the cover back on, they'll put a little more pressure on those chips. And I think I got it all. We'll find out when I put this back together. In the meantime, it's time to get at this keyboard because I did bust that one key. Right, I wanted to make sure that I got that one plunger out of there. There, there it is. That's the escape key. I ended up using uh, contact cement to try to put that on there, which kind of worked, but uh, it didn't hold the key in place. It'll do now for a placeholder. I've got a cunning plan to deal with that later. So let's get the keyboard at least partially assembled so that we can put our keys back in and test them when the retro writing is finished.
There we go. Now, while I was cooking these keys, uh, someone else decided to bake a pizza in the same oven-stove combination. And, well, that uh, proved to be a disastrous decision for them. I mean, look at that space bar. You'll be able to see up close right away. Hmm, that does not look good. In the meantime, I'll leave these in to soak just to get the rest of the peroxide off of there. The space bar melted. I think what happened was that we were trying to boil the keys. We pretty much got them. This space bar actually shrunk. The supports the su for the sides here um, have uh, are no longer aligned with with the original slots here. I think what I'm going to end up doing is attempt to order a replacement spacebar from somewhere. <laughs> My goodness. Oh well. On the positive side, we were able to save the return, zero, and enter keys. All the other keys should be fine. Some of them were a little warped. They are now trapezoids instead of rectangles. <laughs> but let's see how it looks when the, comp when the keyboard is fully assembled. And I finally get to do my key insertion montage. <laughs> While I'm grateful for getting this iPhone 14 Pro, I do need to learn to fix the exposure on it. It was very bright and the colors were a little washed out, so I tried to do some adjustments post-production. But at least we can get these keys in here in the meantime. I just have the damaged spacebar there as a placeholder while I get the other keys in. At least the other keys turned out rather well. I think the printing faded a little bit. Again, I'm going to use the smaller heating element next time I attempt this, and and I'm going to tell uh, the folks who are staying here, do not cook anything in the oven while I'm attempting a retro bright. <laughs> and aside from the escape key, we got the Commodore key in there at last. Let's check on the case pieces. They've been in there for a good five hours and the water is now pretty cold, right? So that's not bad. You can still see the outline of where it was much more yellowed than the rest of the case, but it is looking much better. I'll do the top half for a short duration than the following day. In the meantime, let's get the mother motherboard and the RF shield back in this uh, case. This is a little tricky getting in there, just had to put it in a certain direction. But once I did that, it was fine. may have noticed that some of the chips don't have their heatsink compound, but that's okay. I bent out those parts of the, of the RF shield a little bit better. Let's give this keyboard a quick test now. Seems to be working, except now, uh, you see the cursor's flashing really quickly. I think we have a stuck key. It took a while to realize, like, wait a minute, that's the escape key, that's that plunger. Because there's no spring holding it up, it's just making constant contact. So if I were able to at least pull it up, then the problem went away. So at least for now, I'm going to stick a spring and the escape key in there. I can't actually use the escape key, but at least with holding the plunger up, I can test all the rest of the keys properly. And this keyboard, aside from the locking keys, worked just fine. And I'll solder the locking keys back just before I finish this assembly. Okay, time to put the RF shield and combination heat shield back into place. Don't worry, I did notice that one heat sink uh, still not quite in place. I fixed that up later on. Here's day two of the Retrobrite. I've got the top half of the case in there, and the water was a little warmer than normal, 
I didn't bother uh, cooling it down any with tap water, but uh, it did warp a little bit. It is, however, more or less uh, uniform. However, after I brought it out of the Retrobrite tank, there was some excess peroxide in some places where it collected and it left some marbling. I tried to scrub that off just with the simple abrasive pad and soap and water. So there is some distinct marbling on this case. It's hard to see on camera, but at least it is no longer yellow. It is otherwise a uniform, uh, whatever the factory color is. Off-white, gray, I don't know. Okay, it's now three or four days later, and I was able to pick up this. It's a keyboard for a Commodore Plus 4. Notice that it has a very similar space bar uh, stabilization, very similar spots for springs, and a plunger that actually matches the upper row keys on the Commodore 128. More importantly, the space bar itself is an exact match. So now I'll be able to replace this <laughs> with a proper fitting space bar. This thing even has the proper guide, uh, the guide posts here. So let's get this uh, 128 taken back apart. We'll replace uh, the springs and, and guide things and so forth. We'll also replace the plunger on the escape key so that it has a properly working plunger. The plungers from the Plus 4 are an exact match for the top row of keys, but not for the rest of the keys. If I wanted to use a Plus 4 plunger for the spacebar, I would also have to retrieve the spacebar uh, plunger from the Plus 4 keyboard. There we go, nothing's loose. Alright, now we can put that escape key properly back, there we go. Also, the springs from the Plus 4 keyboard are an exact match for the ones from the 128. So we're able to get this spacebar in here. But I first try using the plunger that came with the 128, and that is just not fitting right. The springs fit, the guide rails uh, fit, the key itself generally fits, but it will not fasten into that plunger. Yeah. Nope, nope, Gorg, you got it right there. It's just, they're just not quite a good fit. Fortunately, we've got lots of uh, plungers on that plus four, and we can steal the one from the space bar. Okay, so I have replaced that, and I lost it. Righto, let's try that again. <laughs> Then. Well, we do get this attached, and after lining all the springs up, we were able to fasten this space bar in place, and well, there we go. That's working much better. So, this keyboard is whole again. <laughs> Let's try one more time. I picked up uh, Attack of the Petski Robots for the 128, and I did get the box version, so I've got the controller, but right now, I'm trying to use a downloaded version of it. And I'm not having much luck of it, or at least I think I'm not having much luck of it, until I discover something rather important. Oh, that's a progress bar. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it actually finishes. Oh, it's still going. Man, it's too bad the SD to IEC doesn't support burst mode. That would have been beautiful. I understand it supports Jiffy DOS, so I might try to hack that on here. I don't know. But we'll wait for it to actually finish loading. There we go. Does this SID chip sound right to you guys? Let me know. I mean, I think it sounds right, but uh, hey, 
If it sounds off, let me know in the comments. It'd be hard to get a SID chip for a 128, though. I'd like to avoid that, if at all possible. Anyway, time to finish assembling this 128. I got a new cable tie for the keyboard. I soldered back in all the locking keys. And I don't know where my side cutters went. I ended up having to use my nail clippers. Jeez, more household tools used in the ways they weren't intended. These locking keys are a little de easier to deal with than they were on the VIC-20 and on the Breadbin 64. Just little hooks around. But they did work out rather well. Just a quick solder and there we are. This keyboard is whole again. Okay, so apparently this thing rests like this and I'm guessing the keyboard then supplies pressure to hold that in place. Let's get this thing fully assembled then. Without needing any super glue or hot glue or whatever, we put that power LED in place and we fasten the keyboard. Now, the case did get a little bit warped from me leaving a rock on top of it during the hot water retrobrite, but uh, this keyboard was able to bend it back into place when I fastened it, and then fastening it to the bottom half of the case was able to straighten it back out again. So not bad, not bad at all. Oh no, did I actually forget that? Oops, I'm gonna have to check that heatsink! My goodness, how did I forget that? That's just double-sided tape on the label. It fit just fine. And these last three screws fixed the remaining uh, warping in the top half of the case. Just make sure it was lined up, then I tightened everything down, and it all snapped back into place. There we are. Here's a quick before and after. Not bad at all, all things considered. Well, I've only got a look before the battery runs out on my iPhone. But here we go, we got a nice cleaned up Commodore 128, working spacebar, working keys, and we are ready for our demo at St. Paul. We'll take a look at that demo in the next episode. Until then, good day.